Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Deep Roots Many Voices Symposium. Um, I'm Marianne Kovach, the Associate Program Director for the Blue Ridge Music Center. Um, I work with the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, which is the primary nonprofit partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. The foundation partners with the Parkway on fundraising, projects, and programs, including the music programs at the Blue Ridge Music Center. Uh, we invite you to come visit us May through October at milepost 213 on the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is just south of Galax, Virginia and north of Mount Airy, North Carolina. The Visitor Center, opened by or operated by the Blue Ridge Parkway, houses the award-winning Roots of American Music Museum with a comprehensive exhibit tracing the history and influence of the Blue Ridge Mountain music and culture. Music programs at the Music Center include Midday Mountain Music, which is a free informal presentation by local musicians held every day the Music Center is open from noon to 4 p.m. on the covered open-air breezeway. Uh, we have Saturday evening concert series, Memorial Day through Labor Day, which is held in the spacious outdoor amphitheater. And new this year, we have something called Milepost Music, which is concerts that are held in additional locations along the parkway. And we'll have more information on that on our website soon. Our programming continues year-round with on-the-road concerts and events that are presented in partnership with other venues or held online, such as the symposium. Um, for this, we are grateful to our sponsors for the Deep Roots Many Voices Project, who are the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, the Blue Ridge Parkway, the National Endowment for the Arts, and our promotional sponsor, the Bluegrass Situation. For the past couple of years, we've had special projects focusing on diversity. Last year, we explored women in music, and this year we broadened it to include not just gender, but also race, ethnicity, and sexual identity, exploring issues in diversity and inclusion in roots-based music. The Deep Roots Many Voices Symposium follows the release of five video discussions with musicians from underrepresented groups. During this event today, we'll focus on strategies to increase diversity on stage, behind stage, in the audience, and in organizations. The symposium starts out with a keynote address by Amy Reitenauer Jacobs, followed by segments from our video series that highlight some of the themes of the symposium. Both of these portions of the symposium are pre-recorded. Uh, the video will be followed by a live panel discussion with Atiba Berkeley, Michelle Concison, Dom Flemons, Charlie Lowry, Joe Siemens, Kamara Thomas, and Brandy Waller-Pace. You'll have the opportunity at the end of the discussion to ask questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. We're glad you could join us today for the Deep Roots Many Voices Symposium. So give me just a moment to get this set up, but here is Amy Reitner Jacobs with the keynote address. Welcome, and thank you for joining me today at Blue Ridge Music Center's Deep Roots Many Voices Symposium. My name is Amy Reitenauer Jacobs, and I'm speaking to you today from the indigenous land of the Keech, Tongva, and Chumash people, now known as Los Angeles, California. A little background about myself. In 2012, I co-founded the Bluegrass Situation with my business partner, Ed Helms, with the goal of bringing roots and traditional music in its many incarnations to a younger, more internet savvy generation of existing and potential fans. Since that time, my role within the industry has expanded. I've been an event booker for the International Bluegrass Music Awards, Bonnaroo Music Festival, and the LA Bluegrass Situation, along with other live activations. I've been an artist manager for talent ranging from Aubrey Sellers, Jamie Drake, and Matthew Electrician to Will Coe's Michael Jorgensen. And I've proudly served for the last eight years on the board of directors of Folk Alliance International, where I am currently the board president. Truth be told, I never intended this career. I moved to Los Angeles to work in the film and television industry, but quickly, albeit someone accidentally, I found that my people were not in corner offices of movie studios, but were playing their own style of bluegrass music in sweaty, crowded bar venues on the west side of the city. Once I entered the scene, however, I could also clearly see where the genre's biggest needs were, pay gaps, lack of representation, and a general disregard by an old guard for those who were too young or female or gay or not white enough. In the years that followed, I've refocused my attention on giving a platform to those who have long deserved better. I recently heard someone say, being of good intention does not always equate to action. So today, I'd like to present to you several small action items that you can do that can make a big impact in your own musical community. So here we go. Seven small ways to make a better industry in any way you can. 
Number one, consciously push yourself to discover music outside of the algorithm. Your musical world is much broader than you think. For the first time in human history, we have the entirety of recorded music instantaneously available to us. And what do we do with it? We listen to the same records over and over, and we're told that what we might like based on a computer program is better than a real live music editor. Start stepping outside of your comfort zone. Don't just research your favorite artists, influences, and collaborators, but look up that generation's influences and collaborators. The world's musical family tree is vast and much more interconnected than you'd expect. See where branching out takes you, both personally and creatively. Number two, take up space. Create opportunities that lift up yourself and others. If you're unhappy with how and where you're getting to perform, then produce the opportunity that you've always wanted. This can apply to festival showcase rooms, conference panels, house concert locations, touring bills, anything, really. It will not always be easy, but given the right amount of time and consistent dedication, it will draw in the right like-minded people and positive attention. Number three, diversity and equity are only performative if changes aren't implemented at every level, from the boardroom to the green room. It's one thing to diversify a festival roster with gender parity and BIPOC artists, but it's important for these standards to continue in hiring practices and leadership development. If you have the power to make these changes yourself, do it. If you witness performative diversification without deeper action, call it out. It's important. Nine years ago at Folk Alliance International, our board was less than 50% female, had one non-white board member, and no directors from outside of North America. Through the concerted efforts of the nominations committee and executive leadership, that same board now consists of over 50% women, has over 50% non-white directors, and has added representation from three different continents in less than a decade. Real effective changes can take place in so many minute collective ways. Number four, don't just promote that which is popular, promote that which is good. This may seem like an obvious one, but it's more uncommon than you'd think. Similar to my first point, it's easier for promotion and reporting these days to simply be a regurgitation of what the algorithm tells us. If you have a platform, podcast, or channel where you can highlight other artists, Use it to showcase those who may have been overlooked or not had the budget to pay for a shiny PR firm, but rather those who deserve the accolades nonetheless. This is not to disparage those who've been managing to capture the cultural zeitgeist, but trust me, more often than not, they will draw enough attention on their own. And at the very least, it'll make you a much more interesting person with real and diverse opinions about music. Number five. Mentorship matters. Find someone who will help guide you through the hard stuff because chances are they've already gone through harder. Even better, become a mentor to someone else. Often we only think of mentors as elder statesmen. And while it's often true that age begets wisdom, mentorship can also come from people with just different life experiences or background, but of a similar age. <clears throat> the key in mentorship is honesty, vulnerability, and trust. One thing I know for sure is that I would not be anywhere near where I am today without a few key people I know I can always turn to. And that takes me to point number six. Find your people. I cannot emphasize this enough. Your job will not be there if you're down on your luck or sick in the hospital or grieving a loss, but your people will. I realize this is not specific to the music industry, but the fact remains that the most important thing you can invest in are the people around you. Friends, peers, mentors, collaborators, and family members. These are the ones who will show up in the middle of the night. They will inspire your most beautiful art and they will hold you accountable. They'll celebrate your wins and embrace you through your losses. I think if we learned one thing from the pandemic, it's that things we considered guaranteed can disappear in an instant, but having a solid community base, no matter how small, is a vital part of making sure you can take care of yourself and show up for others. Which is a nice segue to my final suggestion. Number seven, do not forget that self-care is a radical choice. 
In an industry that pushes us to never stop working, whether that be creating content or touring or networking or pushing ourselves to put in more hours than there are in a single day, taking the time and courage to say no and meaning it in order to prioritize ourselves can be a superpower. Saying no or I don't have time doesn't have to mean literally every second of my schedule is accounted for, but rather I am giving as much of myself as I am currently able to give, and that's okay. In a world that is consistently overwhelming, it can be difficult to feel like our actions lead to any real difference. And many of these issues, specifically those faced by women, black and brown people, the AAPI community and queer and trans folks have been built systemically to oppress over hundreds and hundreds of years. Rhiannon Giddens was recently quoted in Vulture magazine saying, it's not going to change overnight, but we can change a lot of little things quickly. These are some of the most important changes of all, small and deliberate and real. Over time, these are the actions that seed lasting change. Folk and roots traditions are, by definition, the music of all people. It may take some longer to see that the music we love and represent was not just magically invented out of thin air by a few old white dudes from 50 years ago. So let's start changing that story by working on our own tiny actions every single day. Thank you to the Blue Ridge Music Center for your invitation to speak with you today. I am consistently impressed by your wonderful team and your extraordinary work. Thank you for showing all of us how rich and deep of a story there is to tell and how much more there is to learn. A special thanks to all of you for being here and for listening, and I hope to see you down the road soon. Bye-bye. But the thing that really kept me um, centered was my purpose. And my purpose was very much wrapped up into my indigenous um, lineage, both my mother and father from being the Caribbean Indians and, and North Carolina. So yeah, because of everything that was going on in terms of environmentally, and um in every way you can imagine and i was always aware of what um all indigenous people of the world were what they were up against i, I knew that at a very early age and so that was very important to me and so when music when it came time to like really write and uh, i'd say buffy had a lot to do with that and so that was that influenced me and um so i really wrote a lot of very hardcore um heartfelt um what some people would call protest songs but i don't call them protest songs they're just songs of of my people and my family and you know so yeah that's a, that's enough of an answer I started to feel like every time I sang that song that I was coming out to the audience. And it was sort of a way that I could come out and I was introducing this and saying, this is someone else's story that I've written, but he has the same first name that I do. And he, uh, you know, there are some similar elements in our experiences and I started to feel really nervous sometimes when I was going to feel like I had to come out to an audience. If I looked out at the audience and thought, okay, this doesn't look like a, you know, I mean, visually, you know, sometimes you step out on stage and you, you see faces and you wonder, you know, where the, where is everyone coming from? You know, am I going to be able to reach people if I come out in uh, a song, you know? And I started wearing a rainbow banjo strap when I was in college as well and started to, sing some of the traditional songs from with pronouns that I identified with, you know, just started singing a love song. If I was going to sing a love song, I would just sing it with 
he, him pronouns the way that I felt it and that a lot of time the black community does not hear about these artists. Uh -huh. And I definitely, um, today, you know, I, a lot of that is like, you know, with um, rap and hip hop, you right. know, um, a lot of people associate like, they want to call like black, like hip hop and rap music, like black people's music. Right. When you know, music's not a race. It's a, it's a That's form exactly. of music, you know, like anybody can play any kind of music they want to, if they exactly. want to, you know, and, um, yeah, I mean, definitely, I just think taking these stigmas away that the musics are to a certain race is a very important thing in growing. Oh, very much so. Start um, just in thinking about Dark Water Rising because we played more of a contemporary style of music with traditional elements in it. Um, sometimes people didn't really know how to take us or what to expect. Um, and our name threw them off. Upon seeing our name, they thought we might've been a rock and roll band or a heavy metal band. And then uh, we were fronted by uh, three females, uh, myself and two of my other sisters. Um, and it just took, took People didn't know how to take us, but then when we came with messages of love and hope and um, just messages that all of humanity can relate to, I think people enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, we had some people that were expect when they found out we were an all native band, they were expecting the drum or flutes maybe. Um, and we did incorporate some elements into our shows I usually always played brown skin with the hand drum. Um, but, you know, it's like when people read your bio or see your picture and find out you're native, they expect a certain thing out of you. And so it was always nice to catch them by surprise and, uh, you know, also include elements of who we were as, as tribal people. When you're an artist, you are a little bit of a gatekeeper and you have an opportunity to bring like these, the four gentlemen that play with me in my band are from different genres and have played in different places. And country music is not necessarily, country and Americana is, is not necessarily something that they've played before or that they've been involved in before. And so now they have this, this, these, these, like Merle Fest and Newport Folk Festival and some of the other things that I'm going to be involved in, um, they can add to their resumes. And now they have that experience. And so now they have an opportunity to, if you know they decide they don't want to continue to play with me, they can go off and find someone else. And hey, listen, I've played country. I've played Americana. I've done Merle Fest. I've done this. I've done that. And it adds to their resume, it adds to their experiences, and it adds to the places that they are represent that we are represented and that we can go in. And I never thought about it like that until recently. And it's like, I don't think a lot of musicians think of it that, that way, because everybody's just very intent, as you should be, on picking the best person. And I'm just very lucky that I got the best people, and they're the best people, and they also happen to be Black people as well. And so like everybody wins, but I think that there is something to thinking about bringing other people like you that wouldn't normally have that experience and opening up a world of opportunity to them as well. And so I hope I've communicated that well, but, um, yeah, I, I, you know, but as far as like the audiences and stuff in, are concerned, I mean, most of the people that listen to my music, quite frankly, are like, I call it NPR listeners. I'm an NPR listener, but it's mostly like, it's grown ups, and <laughs> a lot of them are white and, um, and there are black people in the audience as well. But um, I, I've come to terms with that's 
for now until more outreach is done and 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 that sort of thing um that's what the audience is you know one black performer at a venue for instance that's you know not really going to change people's perception of the music you know you have to get more and more black people starting to be a part of these events on a regular basis um and it's um i you know in the music in, like especially in the bluegrass and old-time music industry it's hard because there's not a lot of black performers but you know the more black people you can get into it the more kind of ways you can you know a lot of people i think it's important to kind of step away and you know you might have to go in some other routes to get people to come in that are more diverse, you know, like you might have to get people who are more of like Americana or folk and um, that might be black playing the music. And I think that's a really important thing to kind of getting those audiences in because, um, you know, as I've been to concerts where it's just like an all white crowd and, you know, sometimes it is a little, you know, alarming because you don't know what's going to be said. And like, if something is said, are you going to be able to, like who's going to have your back there it makes a huge difference for me on stage uh, to see uh, people of color out in the audience it's very rare you know um, it's no secret that the Abert brothers are there's a lot of americans who are mostly white at our shows and I have no, no problem with that whatsoever. Obviously, I wouldn't be in the band if I did. Um, but it does always bring a huge smile to my face when uh, I see, you know, like an Asian family with their kids sitting front row. Uh, it just inspires me to, like, be a better person on stage just so that I can be someone that, you know, I, I know what my parents would say. It's like, oh, look at that guy. He's, he's just like you, you know. And so that, that enters your brain, even though, you know, you try really hard for these things not to enter the conversation when you're up there making uh, making music, creating art, you, you really don't want it to be about, about this, you know, racial thing that might be there. But it's hard not to as you get older and as you start to realize, you know, these are things that, that as a, as a young person, I, I knew I, I was pushing down, I was suppressing, you know, because I want, I wanted to assimilate, because I was growing up in rural North Carolina, I didn't have I had like five Asian friends, you know, they all went to my high school. There's like maybe five of us that went to my high school. And, and so it was not something that was celebrated uh, as an early musician, as an early artist. Um, and it wasn't until in a way, you know, finding oneself or figuring out who you are as a person that that started to matter more. Um, and now um, it's hard for it not to matter. You know, I, I see through a different lens than I had before just because I want it to matter, you know. Like going forward, like I think after after having some of the experiences that I've had mm -hmm. and and getting older and that sort of thing, I think I realized the importance of reaching back yeah. not just looking back but reaching back and making sure that you're not only glorifying yourself and talking about you know how great what i'm doing and the, but like letting people know what the motivations are behind what you're doing letting people know what the inspirations are behind what you're doing and that you're not the first person to have a lot of these ideas and so rather than take all the glory for myself. And yes, isn't this a great idea that I just had? It's like, actually, I'm standing here because of this, 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 and this. And mm -hmm. you should check that if you want to understand me or understand this time or understand whatever, this is, this is the source. That's this right. is the start. And like, this is where, and I think that's really important. And so all of a sudden I found that my job wasn't just playing my music and doing glorifying me, even though I enjoyed the music, I'm playing it, mm -hmm. I want to get some credit. I found that also there was a need. There was a yes. need to create awareness. There was a need to tell stories that could enrich the audience in a way that they might not even know. 
And, and, and at times I found that they've been really wanting it, not even knowing mm-hmm. that this was a part of the history. And I found that the intention of what I was doing changed. All of a sudden I found, here's my work, but my work can also be uh, telling people about another artist, mm-hmm. telling people about a, uh, an article or an album or some other thing that helps just deepen the experience, especially if they're into what I'm doing. Here's, here's, here's part awesome. two, three, four, 10,000. Yeah. <laughs> no, I love that. But the music has a power to bring people together and you can connect with people who are very different from you. And I think that's the really important work, like what Joe was describing, you know, if you sit down in a fiddler's convention and you're willing to listen and be be gentle in a way and to acknowledge that we're all coming from a different perspective and we can still enjoy playing music together even if we don't have the same political orientation or you know back you know there's there's a lot of potential in music for healing and for connecting across divides um not that we should ignore those divides or not that we shouldn't work to create justice in the world i mean i certainly believe we should but i think maybe part of how we do that is by genuinely listening to people that are different from us you know which is hard to do hard for me and hard for everyone I want to thank everyone who was, took part in those uh, video discussions because they were just were really wonderful discussions. Um, and I know that we have two of those people, Dom and Charlie, are here today. So thank you for agreeing to be part of this as well. But I know one of the things you talked about was looking outside your algorithm. And some of the questions is, how do you go about doing that? So um, if you guys want to talk a little bit about how to actually go beyond your algorithm, how to find people um, that are different from what you may already be listening to or people you already know um, and other kinds of things along those lines. Um, I could probably start. Um, In my journey with blues, uh, I didn't come from the blues community. Um, So coming in, my perspectives were not informed by like a, a background in blues. You know, I wasn't a blues player. I've been listening to blues since I was a teenager, but I wasn't exclusively going to blues festivals and stuff. And when I took over our organization, um, we had kind of a very purist mindset um, that was happening as far as how we were being booked and stuff. And so one thing that we did um, in saying, how could I break out of this objectively? How could I not attack people? How could I, you know, make it something palatable was we decided to start doing annual themes. Um, And by doing annual themes, we were able to add to um, what I call like our institutional knowledge base. You know, so uh, the first year um, we, the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame had inducted um, Blind Boy Fuller into the um, Hall of Fame and said, how do you celebrate that? And the first thing I knew was I told my board, we have to end our festival with a black man on play on stage playing Piedmont and acoustic. We actually happen to have Dom do that for us. They thought I was crazy. Nobody builds festivals up to a solo act ending. But um, to authentically celebrate someone, you have to be uh, holistic and authentic about how you do it. And that's kind of the strategy that worked the first year. And after I saw that it worked and it was so well received, we just continued. So then we went to Women of the Blues uh, and the institution had to invest in Women of the Blues. And since we're blues, black women had to be at the forefront of that. And that, and now our board and everybody had to, and and, and we do it for the year. It's not just a festival. So everything we do throughout the year kind of did that. So that's one way that we used was we said, we're gonna choose a guiding principle and we're gonna stick with that. And then the next year we're gonna pick another one. And now each year we're adding to our lexicon. We're adding to um, what we, our body of work um, and our history and our assets also. So when we go back, um, it's something that we can share you know, so. Well, I'd, I'd love to kind of ta- uh, dovetail on that just a little bit when it came to my uh, my headlining set at the end of the festival. But I, I again, the, breaking the algorithm is something that I, I've 
I've only done so much because I've never been driven by an algorithm when it, it's come to music making. I started to really seriously collect around 1998 and 1999 when I started to play guitar. So the idea of there being a preset pattern in which music could be listened to was a little bit different than we see now. Uh, when it comes to the headlining set, over the years, one of the things that a, a good uh, mentor of mine named uh, Mike Seeger told me was that you really have to display all of your major influences, especially if you spent a lot of personal time with people who are no longer with us. And in the context of Blind Boy Fuller, a lot of the musicians I got to meet specifically through Music Maker Relief Foundation were a lot of musicians who had been influenced by Blind Boy Fuller. Not just them, but their cousins, their uncles, and family members had learned from records or saw Fuller, and then they applied that to their own style. Like I think of someone like John D. Holman. John D. played Blind Boy Fuller, but he also played Lightning Hopkins, Ray Charles numbers, Jimmy Reed, and things that were uh, reflective of his generation of the blues in its different forms. And so when I'm performing, I try to think of the skeleton for my set as a way to be able to tell stories. And I think of each song as sort of a five minute segment where I can tell a little bit about the influences where I got it personally, as well as some of the history that I can uh, share about each of the songs. And then of course, showing different styles of music, showing that there are different ways to play Piedmont style is, is key as well. And so that's been something that, uh, with a lot of my presentations is trying to show diversity even within styles of music where people may not know there is a diversity. Most people don't know that there's a difference between Delta Blues or Piedmont or even that Piedmont Blues can go all the way from uh, Maryland down to Georgia. And so just being able to display some of those ideas in a way that's easy for people to hear, it, it makes the words more powerful when you tell the story. And then of course music it brings it all together and that's that's kind of one of the ways I've been able to do that. Of course that was a beautiful time to be able to uh, also uh, be able to dovetail into the legacy of Blind Boy Fuller who is such an influential artist. I would follow up on that by, by saying that I believe that the breaking the al algorithm is also a metaphor right for getting out of your comfort zone or just getting out of the little the place you find yourself. And so something that we've done with the Rhapsody Project is just invite everybody present to share parts of their heritage, right? So part of the way you can do that authentically in person with people is to learn about the heritage, the people in the room and encourage the people there to explore that heritage and educate the community about what they come from. And that'll expose you to elements of culture that you wouldn't otherwise learn about. So I think, I think that's a powerful way to do that offline or in person. Some, a through line I keep hearing is um, not being said explicitly, but music isn't just in the performance or the tune. It's very interconnected um, to just what happens in life. And so getting outside of that algorithm or that comfort zone, it's just like, you know, getting to know friends, like oh, so much of what I know of just trad music, old time, jug band, whatever, is just being fortunate enough to meet people like Dom, like he was one of the first people that I talked to at length at like a Juneteenth thing. And I was like, I don't know all the history and stuff. And he like sat and talked me through all these things and having a lot, an actual human versus, you know, flipping through albums or a catalog or something online and being able to meet people in real life. Joe, the same way. I've been just like sitting in a room with Joe makes such a huge difference. And um, in my work, I talk about remembering that each style of music or artist or whatever, it's like a friend, right? You know, certain things about your friend, you know, they're not all the same, you know what they need, you know what your relationship is. And having that level of connection with music as life experience, I think gets you outside of, of that comfort zone. I like to add, um, was I cutting somebody off? Mm. I was just going to say something real quick, just uh, looking um, inside more, looking locally, looking inside your local communities, uh, building up the culture that way. And just me speaking as an Indigenous woman from Robinson County, I think of all the talented up and coming and musicians that are trying to establish themselves, but we're under the radar. And so I feel like if we keep pushing one another, that we're going to break through. Um, so just 
keeping keeping the local scenes in mind, local communities and what you all can build, build up. Like I consider, I look at Robinson County and that area in, in Southeastern North Carolina is like the next hub, or it could be a hub like Motown or Muscle Shoals is right there in that area. And so that's what I mean by building up that, that community where, you know, people, people wouldn't expect it. And so with more outside support, mainly from my fellow musicians in North Carolina, I feel like we could break an algorithm by uplifting a community that, you know, could take you by surprise. That makes a lot of sense. It kind of leans into what I was going to say, which is like the, um, the idea that music is just music, I think is so wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one thing we've done here um, at, the, at the Blue Society is we've said we refuse to accept music um, as the only thing. We celebrate blues as a culture. And like, I know Charlie, you celebrate your culture. You're not celebrating music. <laughs> Nothing you do is musical for me when I see it. It's cultural and music is the way you can, is one way you can communicate it, you know? Um, and that's how I feel about, you know, um, kind of all art of the African diaspora, any culture. Um, and so when we look at it that way, like this is a picture we commission people are like, why is a blue society commissioning art? That's a picture of Libba Cotton. I was walking down the street at a music festival and I see this guy and I'm like, is that Libba Cotton? He's like, how do you know who this is? <laughs> you know, he's just surprised that I knew as I was that he was drawing it. Um, this is Darius Quarles from Durham Five Points Gallery, by the way. Um, and it was, it was just amazing, but we needed to have that connection. So, you know, the, those, the ways that our art is connected through literature, um, I often ask the question, I can't wait to get funded to do a program about this, but why did Langston Hughes write about blues more than anything else, living in the jazz A's in New York City? Like, why? <laughs> That's important for us, right? But, you know, we have to look at how they're connected, the way that food is connected. Um, we, we're partnering with a farmer's market, you know. Um, we're partnering with uh, food equity organizations, Second Harvest, we're, and we're telling people, you know, okra and watermelon are African foods, but why? Because food scarcity. When someone's not eating, but they have a seed in their pocket, they're gonna scrape us out a little dirt. And, but without that happening, without someone having to go through that struggle of feeding themselves, we don't get blues. So that's another way to break the algorithm is stop looking at it as just music. When you look at that culture, you really have to look at the people. Um, even if we're not trying to be political, the politics and the social dynamics all play a role in that. And that breaks us out of the algorithm really easily and make, gives us more access to a bigger audience. Someone doesn't have to care about a guitar lick for me to engage them. They can just want kids to eat. And now I can bring them into my blues narrative. I would also add, um, Go ahead, what, Mark. Very, very, very short, because um, everyone's addressed. I, I'm just nodding and clapping to everyone, what everyone's saying. But that, um, you know, again, uh, that community seems to me to always be the answer, right? That, um, and in fact, you know, not to put it too polarized, but to, to realize that industry in a, in a general sense um, was created um, as, as an unjust system. And, and oppressed music and musicians right from the, its inception. And so, you know, the industry uh, as a machine is always going to be creating, the, the idea that somehow we're going to like infiltrate an industry and change it. And it's like, that seems like a whole lot of work <laughs> that, that could be sidestepped by simply investing our energy and our time into what Charlie's saying, what Atiba's saying of, of of really building up our, our communities and knowing that that the music, when it comes to the music, it's not just the music and it is person to person, like Brandy was saying, that it's that it's really about what I can show up to do and connect with the people in my community. Um, and that, you know, for breaking out of my algorithm, you know, and the reason we created Country Soul Songbook was to do that 
really focused on us as artists to like get to provide a platform for artists to begin connecting those dots again to be in more communities so that we can draw those lines across you know not just our local communities but like connecting our local community to another local community across the state across the country across the continent so that um you know we're we're all in communication as artists because artists by nature are community builders and so um as we show up to stages integrated intersectional you know that is going to um that's going to reverberate into the audience sphere as well so brilliant and um one thing I might want to add on to that as well is the individual study of music as well as we talk about community. One of the, the great action items that we can do once we're thinking along communal lines is really building up our individual study of what has been written before. Because as we talk about changing narratives, uh, one of the things that happened for me is I was one of the only young people in my scenes, not just person of color, uh, African-American and Mexican-American, but I was like the only person under 50 when I joined my community at age 16. So uh, in some ways I was sort of, uh, I was kind of like a fish out of water just by an age demographic, let alone anything else that had to do with music. So a lot of my individual study, I started out playing drums. So when I was playing the guitar, I was drawn to a lot of the early country blues because it had polyphonic rhythms within the guitar parts. So that gave me a, a whole other way to think about um, the blues as an instrument on the guitar, as well as the uh, music of the banjo. But I also decided to spend a lot of time moonlighting in my own library, looking up books on the blues, trying to understand what people had already written. Because again, you know, we're in the 21st century and there are a lot of moments where when reading source material, you might find language that doesn't suit the modern day. And just being able to face that language dead on and also take years to really uh, ingest and understand what they're saying and how you can update that narrative into a future into a more positive, more inclusive narrative. That's something that I've tried to do my whole career. And again, this was something that no one taught me when I became a professional musician. But like everybody on this panel, they, everybody knows I keep some songs in my back pocket. So whenever I'm meeting musicians as well, I have albums, I have songs, I have materials that I personally found so that when I meet someone and learn something about them, I am presenting material that I feel suits what they're interested in already. And I do this to the audience as well. When I'm playing songs, I've created a set list so that the audience can turn around. Especially I found this when I was in North Carolina. There were a lot of familial connections to the, to the music. More so than just thinking of musical connections. Someone might say, oh, my granddaddy used to play harmonica. And hearing me play harmonica got them thinking about it. And a lot of the way I also found out about a lot of this information is spending time at the merch table taking the time to put my hands on the people and get to know what they're about. Because sometimes you just don't even know what your audience is getting into. I mentioned this in the video, but you just don't know where people are coming from sometimes. And just being able to have extra information in your own pocket and your own mind that you've spent the time to think about, process and digest, you can then present that to other people and sometimes get some beautiful uh, results that you, you know, personally may have never thought of and also the people that receive the information. They might have something new. So, um, Michelle, I, we haven't heard from you yet. I wonder if you have anything to add in yeah. this section here. Oh, I just, I just agree with a lot. Um, I think, in, you know, my perspective, a lot of what Brandy and, and Kamara were saying about people, you know, and others are saying about, you know, when, when, when I heard Amy say, you know, push yourself, number one, push yourself to discover music and get beyond the algorithm, you know, for me, it was like, and people, like for me, it, that's like mu music and people are right next to each other. And that, and that if you're, you know, I think, of course, I'm coming from an industry perspective. I'm a ma art artist manager and a, and a professor and, 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 um, and, and as I hear Kamara talk about the industry that's, that's constructed, um, absolutely um, a system that is, was not made for us. And, um, and I think that 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a part of that system, whether, you know, however I want to be. And I think that, um, I think that part of it is actually, you know, when you talk about the algorithm of music coming at you, it's what you're being fed, right? And you're fed people too. Like you're fed people, not just the artists that get, um, you know, raised up and, and given more of a platform, but the industry that gets more of a platform and who you're told is important and whose opinion you're told to care about and whose opinion, <laughs> whose opinion, whose opinion, whose opinion, right? But I think, um, I think I think it's really important for 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 us in the industry to to put a pause on on the inertia of who we are going to happen to meet. My mother always said, "Choose your friends, don't let your friends choose you." And and I didn't know what she meant. I didn't know what she meant back then, you know. But I kind of know what she means now. Like like um, you know, yeah, be there and receive the interest and intrigue of other people, but. Um, but I, you know, the notion of who, who you surround yourself with is becomes your influence as you progress and through a life in music, like that's real. Um, so that I, I definitely relate everything y'all are saying incredible. <laughs> um, I want to apologize to everyone. I meant to start off by asking you all to introduce yourselves because I'm not sure that everyone who's listening knows who you all are. So I was wondering if we can kind of circle back there and you can tell us a little bit about yourselves um, and about your experiences uh, and who you are. I'll start. <laughs> uh, my name's Charlie Lowry. Honored to be here today with y'all. Um, I am from Pembroke, North Carolina in Lumberton, North Carolina, down in Robinson County. I belong to the Lumbee and Tuscarora tribes. I am a singer first, songwriter. I play guitar as well as the hand drum. And from the years of about 2008 or 2009 to about 2017, I was lead singer of Dark Water Rising, a band in North Carolina. And, you know, our music, we described it as Rocky Soul. So I sing rock, blues, folk, country, gospel. I have a gospel foundation, um, full-time singer, songwriter, musician, and activist for my people and all of humanity, really. So happy to be here. Thank you for having me. This is where we all are going to be pol super polite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll play popcorn and pass oh. it to Atiba. <laughs> all right. So uh, my name is Atiba Berkeley. Um, I am the current president of Piedmont Blues Preservation Society, 37 year old uh, blues society, I'm an affiliate of the Blues Foundation. Uh, I am also a 20 year uh, professional sound engineer, um, working in live music, television and theater um, and a former corporate manager uh, for restaurants and call centers. So my experience has been very mixed up and uh, I'm from New York originally, um, had family in North Carolina and have now been in um, North Carolina for about 20 years. All right, how about you, Michelle? Sure. Uh, my name is Michelle Conceison. Um, I'm an artist manager. So I run a company called MMGT. I manage um, Della May and Kishana and the McCrary sisters. And I um, am also a professor at MTSU. So I teach artist management and music business classes at MTSU. Um, and I am uh, currently the secretary of the board of Inter the IBMA, the International Bluegrass Music Association and chair of the diversity committee there. Um, and, and have done a lot of work over the years with Folk Alliance International, which is how some folks might know me, but I, um, I was on that board for a very long time. And it was, it was cool to hear Amy talk about um, some of the progress that's happened in that organization. Oh, I'm in Nashville. I'm from Boston um, originally. I'm from Massachusetts. I'm actually from Lexington, which is a very rebellious place. 
And um, I uh, live in Nashville, Tennessee. All right, Brandy. Hey, y'all. My name is Brandy Waller Pace. Um, Atlanta, Georgia, born and raised, but now I'm in Fort Worth, Texas, ancestral land of the Wichita and affiliated tribes. And um, I wear a few hats. Um, let's see. I'm a musician, um, jazz, neo soul, but most recently, old time, I play banjo, guitar, write and sing, um, sometimes alone, sometimes with a duo. Um, I am founder and executive director of a nonprofit called Decolonize in the Music Room, and we, our mission is to center Black, Brown, Indigenous, and Asian voices in music and in related fields. Um, I am a PhD student at, in music education at the University of North Texas, and my research focuses on like anti-racism, decolonization, Black feminism, um, Afrofuturism, all that kind of stuff. And um, I am the founder and director of the Fort Worth African American Roots Music Festival, which um, premiered online a couple of years ago, but this year we were in person in March. And it's a festival based in Fort Worth that focuses on Black presence in early American music and um, a lot of, um, oh, I can't remember who said it, going back to the past. Um, oh, it was Reese's clip. A um, lot, of, lot of Sankofa there, and then drawing it into a present and then crafting um, a feature based on um, letting people know that this is our music. And um, I sit on the board of directors of Folk Alliance International. Okay, Kamara, how about you? Hi there, everybody. My name is Kamara Thomas. Uh, I am from Chicago originally, uh, reside now in Durham, North Carolina, uh, indigenous home of the Saponi and Eno uh, people. And uh, I'm a singer, songwriter, uh, multidisciplinary storyteller. Um, also wear a few hats. Uh, I founded the um, I founded Country Soul Songbook in 2019 to um, to just create uh, integrated and intersectional stages for um, for marginalized voices in country and Americana music, um, which um, after the pandemic uh, quickly. Uh, transformed into a, a more virtual format um, that tried to creating those things virtually and uh, we hosted um, uh, so far two annual summits uh, where artists and scholars of this music um, uh, can can chat openly and honestly about the stuff that's most important to us um, uh, in these spaces. And uh, this, uh, for the next two academic years, I'll be teaching songwriting and uh, multidisciplinary storytelling up at Princeton University. And um, I'm releasing an album on May 13th called Tularosa and American Dreamtime that I'm super excited about. That's taken me a good over a decade to uh, manifest. So I'm excited to share that with the world. And um, I don't know, I also wanna mention that I'm so excited because Charlie and I just finished um, uh, doing a whole week uh, of ridiculously fast rehearsing and performing of the first live Country Soul Songbook show since the pandemic began where we were honoring Tina Turner and uh, Linda Ronstadt and Linda Martell. Uh, Reese Palmer was also there, Kim Register. Um, and Queen Esther. And so it was really exciting to just be back in a live space presenting that intersectional stage and um, can't wait for more. All right, Joe, how about you? What's up, everybody? <clears throat> I'm Joe Siemens, honored to be a part of this. Um, I am, uh, I was raised on the lands of the Chinook people. I currently reside in Renton, Washington on the unceded lands of the Duwamish. I'm a fifth generation Oregonian on my mother's side, and uh, I'm a Pacific Northwesterner, lifelong of Northwest European descent. I am the co-founder with my friend and business partner, Benjamin Hunter of the Rhapsody Project. We are um, a community that celebrates music and heritage through an anti-racist lens. Uh, through that um, program, I facilitate conversations in a class called Face the Music, um, using music to confront racism, where we gather for eight weeks and use stories of amazing black American musicians and songs to as a jumping off point to 
talk about how we address racism in our spheres of influence. Um, I'm also a partner in Black and Tan Hall and uh, the board chair of the Maxwell Heritage Interpretive Center. And that work is very much around putting ownership of land in the hands of black and brown folks, um, especially specifically cultural space. Um, and so that is some of the work that I do. I'm also a two bit banjo picker, uh, banjo frailer, guitar picker, and uh, have proud, proud to have said that I have recorded an album with my buddy Dom here and, and have several other musical projects. So that's a little about me. I'll throw it back to, to Marianne. All right, and Dom, I think you're last. Hello, everybody. I'm Dom Flemings. I'm known as the American Songster. I'm a songwriter and a producer, record collector, and uh, a Grammy winner as well. Uh, uh, I served as the very first uh, board African-American board member on Folklines International, so I had that uh, wonderful uh, several years to, to help out with some of the major diversity conversations we, we've been talking about in that organization. Uh, well, uh, you know, a little bit of my background is um, when I ended up going to college after performing, in, uh, like I mentioned, I started out at 16. After performing in the coffee houses, busking on the street, I went to college at Northern Arizona University and got a BA in uh, English, studying Ch everything from Chaucer to Shakespeare all the way through the, the formation of the English language. And I'm proud to say that in two weeks I'll be picking up my honorary doctorate from my alma mater. They, they called me up, and so I'll be picking up my honorary doctorate. And one of the things I found is I started to study folk music because I was going to school studying ancient literature and I got interested in ballads and blues and all the different types of folk music. So I moonlighted in the LP library at the, at the university for many years. And I had a homemade setup that allowed me to burn my own uh, CDs off of LPs. And so I copied thousands of these records through my five years of college. So I was able to amass a lot of music on top of the music I was already buying. And so when I went to um, an event called the Black Banjo Gathering in 2005, I met uh, a woman named Rhiannon Giddens who was mentioned earlier in the keynote address. And um, I made my way from Arizona, where I'm originally from, out to North Carolina and formed a group called the Carolina Chocolate Drops with another fellow by the name of Justin Robinson. And what we decided to do in that group was present traditional music in different forms. And also part of the goal, at least on my personal part of the group, was to show that jazz, blues, folk music, as well as old time music and ragtime were all interconnected by a shared history. Now this is a time before they had any of this information on the internet. So I formed a lot of the data and put together a lot of the literature that formed a lot of the foundation of what we now think of in black roots music. Not that people weren't there before, but a unified singular form of what black roots music could be was something that the Carolina Chocolate Drops put together and we performed on the Grand Ole Opry as the first all black string band. And then later on as after I left the group, uh, Joe and uh, Ben were exciting musicians who I'd, I'd met, so I had them on tour with me. It was very much a concerted effort. After doing an all black string band, I wanted to make sure to show that I could have a mixed race group that could also show that we're, we're all in this together. And Ben and Joe were, were the wonderful uh, musical counterparts as we all traveled together. Then in 2008, I put out an album called Black Cowboys, uh, uh, focusing on the history of the Black West, being from the Southwest. and. Again, going into the source material, I decided to adapt the material in a way that could be handled in the 21st century so that younger people could see this music as a part of them. Because a lot of the uh, black and brown communities, they just didn't see themselves in the literature, even though the stories had always been there in one form or another. So as I traveled, I collected stories and I've always told them in my concerts or when I'm talking to people individually. So I'm, I'm now so glad to see a proliferation of more than just a few people. Now it's so many people, I don't even know everybody, which makes it a, even more uh, exciting in the past 20 years. But it's a pleasure to be on the panel with everybody. Great. I'm going to move on now to one of the other points that Amy had talked about, and that was creating opportunities. Um, she specifically mentioned things like um, to having special festivals, uh, forming some kind of a session during conferences, maybe doing some sort of a stage takeover at a local venue, um, having showcases at, at various events. So just what, what kinds of um, 
experiences have, have some of you had in that area, um, and how would you recommend other people go about doing this sort of thing? I've spent a lot of time trying to break the one a year rule. That's been one of my biggest goal. Uh, right when I came into it, one a year. And that's again, specializing in each type of folk or roots music. It was common for people to book one person of color a year. And that was a big goal for me, was trying to break the one a year rule. And that's, that's my little bit I wanna say about that. Yeah, I would jump in and say, um, you know, so, something that the keynote speaker addressed too is, is uh, I think as artists, um, I know I felt really empowered once I made that decision that I was going to, um, you know, create my organization. I, I'm sure Brandy has some things to say about this too, of, of saying, you know what, this is what I want to see. I have to create it. There has to be a way um, you know, there, there has to be a, a group of people who will help me, um, you know, a little bit of just trust in my community saying, you know, I'm going to start this. I don't have bandwidth to do, to do it all by myself, but I'm just going to plant the seed and let people know what I want to do. And um, quickly got, you know, that kind of triumvirate of Country Soul Songbook together that, that said, okay, we're going to do it. <laughs> um, I don't know how much how much bandwidth we'll have to throw summits forever and ever without a bigger team um, <laughs> because we're all artists and want to kind of focus there. But um, but at the very least saying, you know, we're committed to creating intersectional stages, integrated stages and um, addressing, you know, the idea that that songs need to be put back into into people's bodies. Songs need to be put back into um, black, brown, and queer bodies, um, whether, and, 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 and then those bodies need to be singing their own songs too, that, you know, that we need to be able to just simply, it can be as simple as presenting a stage where you hear the songs and you know that these are songs from the past. These, this is, these are the songs from the present. These are how they're connected. And, um, just putting on that show, you know, that, um, where the talent is undeniable, where it's undeniable, just because you haven't heard it before, just you because you haven't heard of this person before, you know, seeing is believing. Um, so that's kind of where I'm concentrated now is to just keep presenting those stages as often as we can and to, um, and to find ways to get that, that, that show invited to as making it really easy for people to say, oh, sign me up, you know, sign me up. I'm, I'm going to bring you here. I'm going to bring you there. Um, and then keep, keep the, the, um, the rotation of different artists, you know, flowing so that whatever, whatever stage or theme that we create on that stage can, you know, Charlie can jump in when she's when she's available. Someone else can jump in when they're available, so that it becomes a kind of rotating opportunity for um, for the voices that need to be heard. Yeah, that um, creation and space making is such a huge deal. And um, speaking specifically to the festival, um, to my knowledge, it's the only like more like old time based festival that's. Black creative, black led, black lineup, black vendors, et cetera, et cetera. And I think when we create, we're creating those spaces because everyone's not going to create a space. Some people are going to go into existing spaces, and that's the you know we all have a lane, right? Um, being really unapologetic about it is really important. And um, we had Reese Palmer and Color Me Country down as part of the festival, and we had this amazing panel. Our headliners were Justin Robinson, Jake Blunt, Kaya Cater, and um, just like the visual presence of that many representations of blackness is is so important and it combats you know what Dom talked about that only one rule you're going to hear incarnations of these music of of these musics that are next to one another and you're going to hear the contrast you're going to see different types of black faces stories backgrounds everything and um, you you no longer can pretend like there's only one and that you've got all the boxes checked when you see them, but also um, coming into that space and us being really intentional about what it was centered around meant, um, I guess, more deference from folks who were, were not with within Black culture, like willingness to engage and learn, but understanding that um, 
it is totally appropriate to have things that are not centered um, around whiteness with other people on the periphery. And for my organizational work, for the um, festival work, it's really important. And it ties into, again, the idea of Afrofuturism, right? It's not just that we are looking to a future that doesn't exist yet, we're creating it in the present. And I think about my students and I think about my Black children who are like, my, my Black children don't know that mostly white people play old time right now, like, because they've seen fiddlers and banjo players and flat and um, buck dancers and stuff like that's just what they grew up around. And the first exposure to the banjo is their mom singing with them. So I feel like that space making really um, creates the future in the now. And we have to be leaning more toward that instead of thinking like we're making these little steps towards some far away end. Like what is the end and what can we do right now to, um, to make it real? We yeah, and another, yeah, I mean, I think, sorry. I was Please. gonna say and another piece of this too is the organizations that are creating spaces. So I know like at IBMA and Folk Alliance International, especially they have um, things like Shout and Shine and other, and, and usually have some panel discussions. So I know Michelle, you've been involved in some of those. And some of you, it sounds like others of you have been involved in Folk Alliance as well as IBMA. And Atiba, you've really worked with uh, the uh, Blues Preservation Society to really create some of these spaces. So that's another piece to really kind of take a look at and how to go about doing that. How do you approach, if you're not on the board of directors, how do you approach the board of directors or whoever's setting up the conference to say, I would like to do this and set something up? That's a really good, I think that's a really good question. I also think, what can you expect? You know, what should you expect from organizations? Like, I think that when these may when when amazing spaces are created so for example we talk about shout and shine at ibma you know um the 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 dream has to be that those artists that are raised to the attention of, of folks then become become in other parts of the program right so i'm not talking about like when you create a space that's intended to be its own space and and should be um, but when we're talking about trying to um, create more opportunity in, in, in spaces that have been historically white spaces for the presentation of music, um, you know, the, the real thing is I think you have to have sort of your current plan and your long-term vision, and you have to hold organizations accountable when they, when they, aren't, when they, when they only sort of partner with you. You know, like I think it's okay to say, look, um, you know, we want to, we'd love to create a, a, a showcase at an event, or we'd love to curate a stage, but let's work on a three or five year goal of like, where we're not just curating this stage that's over in the corner of this event. Um, you know, or we don't just keep getting a slightly bigger stage each year, but we're not actually in the main program. Like, I think, I think it's okay to also say we want a space. Um, but maybe we get to have that space and also get to be on the main stage, you know, and also get to be like, I loved earlier when, when you said stuff about like programming, a Tiba programming a program that, that led up to Dom playing instead of programming a festival and then figuring out what stage Dom is going to go on. Right. Like, I think that we have to kind of reverse the direction in which we plan things so that we're starting with what we're trying to dream to make as Brandy says, make now, you know, um, and I'm going to get off the sort of soapbox, but, but I think it's hard because we often feel like we're either part of the power or we're, or we're complaining about the people who are in the power. And I think a lot of times these music organizations, it's like, okay, it's, 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 a, it, as you've heard here, it's like, we're all able to be on the board. Like we can do this, like we can do this. It's just get some people to vote and we are on. Like it's, it's happening. Like, so I think um, to me, it's just, it's just that it's like, we're gonna hold each other accountable in the most loving way we can um, because we wanna be part of a community together. Um, but it's not always easy. And every music little piece of the music scene is so different in terms of you know, what the capital is. One thing, oh, one of, oh who was that? Okay. I'll, you, I'll go next. 
Well, thank you. Um, one thing I was gonna say about opportunity, when we look at opportunity, one thing that I know, so I, 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 am, I, uh, I inherited a white institution <laughs> uh, with an 80% white fan base um, and 95, 98% white administrators. Um, and I remember that moment where I had been slowly building up the conversation Then I asked for an agenda item after a festival. And I said, um, the work we're doing is inauthentic. And it was terrifying, <laughs> you know. Um, I have a lot of friends that are brave activists out in the streets and politics, all sorts of places. Um, and um, maybe it's one of the bravest things I've done was to stand up and say that, um, seeing years later, like the change it was able to create. I didn't know that I'd be running the institution. I was just a board member at that point. I wasn't the president. Um, and that wasn't a goal necessarily, but looking at it, where we say, what is opportunity? I think in a lot of ways, I think Dom touched on this earlier, we're looking at it from multiple standpoints. So there's the intergenerational, um, which has a specific thing. Kids don't wanna play what their parents listen to. Never gonna be a thing, <laughs> right? They will come back to it later, but they still need a voice, right? So that's one thing is that intergenerational. And then uh, that intergenre play, um, that we deal with, with, with purism, you know? Um, and when you start attacking both of those, I think it really gives you a strong base to say, to break you out, like to, to, to look at those, the ideas you have to consider, you can then localize them. It doesn't matter where you are, but if you start with what's happening intergenerationally in my genre, in my community and what's happening, um, you know, as far as openness and perspective, it makes a big difference. Like we have a um, program that we're starting, kind of started a few years ago, didn't realize it was gonna be a program Then I realized it was, it's Blues Groove. And we, it's, we talk, we're doing a beat battle. We pick five songs, eight producers have to flip songs. One of them's a 1938 Piedmont style song, Blind Boy Fuller, <laughs> you know? And now these hip hop producers that probably would have never heard this stuff potentially are gonna get introduced to a very specific selection of five different types of blues. And hopefully that sends them down a rabbit hole next time they're in a record store, you know? And that's all we can hope for. And then we do a house music dance party, but all the samples follow our theme for the year. So they loved it when it was, you know, women of the blues, cause they love female soaring gospel and soul samples anyway. You know, um, now this year they have to pick samples that are from artists uh, of age that the songs were released when the artists were 25 or under. You know, so now they've got to do a little bit of history. The DJ has to do a little bit of history, a little bit of research, figure this out, and then let us know. And when they come to the event, we give information. We're not talking, we'll talk about the tenets of hip hop when we're doing hip hop, but in the pamphlet, they're now going to see Blind Boy. Fuller's name in a bio and Sister Lita Tharp. And they might hear the craziest beat. Who knows? Maybe it makes it on Dr. Dre's album. But, you know, and if that does happen, then we really know it's working. <laughs> you know, that's like the cherry on top, but that can't be the goal is to get it on a platinum record. It's to just have that influence, you know. But those two specific things, the intergenerational and the um, interdisciplinary, are kind of, um, I think, a really good base to start for any of us from anywhere. And that's what's helped us here anyway, so. Beautiful. Yes, to all of that. Uh, I would speak to, uh, to Brad's question in the chat about organizations and like how to help, how to help organizations that don't want to be helped. And I would say, don't put your energy into them. Go find the Brandy Pace, go find the, you know, the, the Berkeley Piedmont Blues Preservation Society in your neck of the woods and support their work. You know, like if if you're in an organization that doesn't want to change, then I definitely encourage you, like that's another conversation that is interesting and, and worthwhile, but like don't go out trying to find organizations that aren't trying to hear this work. There's plenty of work to be done in the ones that are trying to do good. And let's, let's put our energy into, the, into those and into making sure that those people have support and that we're putting people in power who reflect the populations we're trying to serve. Right. And, and that's, I think that's where the work, I think that's where the best, the best work or the most effective work can get done. 
Um, there's going to be those organizations that are making themselves obsolete by refusing to listen to the dictates of reason and humanity and create a diverse setting for their festival. And they're going to, you don't have to, they're going to drive themselves to extinction um, until, they, until they see that they need to change. So I, I would say go find the organizations that are, that are already doing the work that you believe in and support them. Um, I, I, I don't mean to be. I don't mean to be too brash, but that's that's what I, that's why I feel our energy is best spent as as activists trying to support and do this work. I I agree I agree with that. You know what you're saying kind of brings up for me something that Sam Gleaves talked about in in that interview too of just you know when you make the choices to sit down with people you don't agree with and when you don't make that choice. Like I think I think sometimes you choose maybe. I don't know about y'all, but for me, it's like, I have to give my, give it like a certain amount of time. Like how, how long can I be in a room with people who I know think I'm going to hell because I'm gay. Right. So I'm like, okay, how long can I be in a room with people who think I'm going to hell because I'm gay? And then, and how hard am I willing to work to overcome, to, to prove them smart enough that they don't have to be thinking about that the whole time they're talking to me. And I think, um, you know, I think that there are times for that. And then there are times for not doing that. <laughs> and um, I find it hard to choose. Brad, I, I understand your question in the Q&A. And Joe, I totally, I like everything in me that wants to be healthy for myself agrees with that. But at the same time, I think um, I also recognize that I can handle being around people who don't agree with me. And that's a, a, something I have to offer. <laughs> Um, and I, I guess I try to do that, but it's hard to decide when it's too much. It's hard to decide when like, this is crossing a line and I don't, you know, you, it, it's hard to know your own clock on that. And sometimes um, you don't know till it's too late. No, shh, excuse you, me. You I think, almost said it out loud. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm living that life. You know, you make your choice to step into these spaces and like, we have rooms about, you know, having a seat at the table, you know, but people don't think about the endurance of the person that's taking that seat and what they're going through while they take it. Um, like I'm a volunteer running a nonprofit almost full time. Um, like it's hard on my family. It's hard on, you know, me. It's hard on my physical health, <laughs> you know, um, to be a sound engineer, moving cases, doing shows, come home at three in the morning, kids up at 7.30 and then I'm in the blues office at nine, you know, <laughs> like, it's, it's hard sometimes, but I, I believe in it. And I know that I have a certain amount of endurance. I did give my wife a promise, but we, it is hard. Like you were both saying, I think you're right, Joe. You do have to find out where you fit, but I would encourage a lot of people to kind of figure out what your endurance is. Like I'm the dude that can have a conversation with a racist at a bar at 1.30 in the morning. And my friends are like, why are you still talking to him? And I'm like, cause I know there's something I can learn here or something I can contribute here. Um, and I have the tolerance for that. I have friends that would have long ago smack this man and walked away, <laughs> you know? Um, so it takes all of those perspectives, I think. And I think that's important to acknowledge also. Um, but identifying what your talent and tolerances are and those of those around you. I've been able to encourage so many people um, to move in ways that I cannot and even enabling them, give them strategy like, hey, this could work. I can't do it, but <laughs> you could. This is how part of how you move, like, you know? so. Um, I think it's all of it. And then, I would also add, oh, go ahead, Charlie. I was just going to say that's where grace comes into play. You have to have grace with yourself and others. And um, just wanted to also take the time to thank the Blue Ridge Music Center and Folk Alliance for even creating, you know, spaces for myself as an Indigenous woman having these conversations, inviting us into the room to share our voices and perspectives. So, you know, even a simple, with, with using technology, this Zoom conversation has enlightened us all in, in ways that we weren't before, you know. Um, each one of us has our own plat our professional platforms and just being able to take it to, you know, when we're at shows and stuff, we only have so much time with each other. We're either performing or rushing, like you said, loading in, loading out. But I think that by having more conversations like this is, is beneficial as well. 
that you knowing your tolerance you. piece. Oh, no, go ahead. That knowing your tolerance level piece and all of that is so important. Organizationally, we try to make sure people know that when you know we're brought into spaces for the sake of diversity, there's so much of an emotional and, and physical toll it takes. Um, I think of Alice Walker writing about womanism. She says, um, not separatist except periodically for health. Sometimes you just, you know, like have to stay alive, right? And um, it's so funny, like Ativa and I were having a conversation about this a long time ago, because it's, like I said, everyone has their lane, right? Like Atiba can sit and listen. And I'm like, if you book, we about to go. So it's like, you just have to realize that there's a range and that all of, all of it is valid. And I think um, organizationally, when we're looking at bringing people into spaces, understand that um, we can also require them to stay respect, respectable and stay nice and all of that, because that's not how things are positioned and there needs to be room for that. I guess that kind of segues to one of our conversations that, that I wanted to have, which was about the audience and how to really kind of create a more diverse um, space for the audience so that it's not so, you know, we although we're looking at diversity on stage, how do we make it so that we're also playing to diverse audiences? Um, so really, there's some things that you, that you brought up, like some of the barriers to diversity, um, both for the, the performers as well as the, uh, the, you know, getting a diverse audience in there, that they feel safe and comfortable that everything's going to, things aren't, aren't going to be uh, said about them or that there's not going to be anything unsafe and that they really feel welcome. But also about handling some of the pushback and hate on social media and in person that sometimes comes along with some of this activity of, uh, of trying to get a more, you know, really create, create more diversity. So I was wondering if you're able to talk about that just a little bit. I'll jump in here. Um, uh, and also just to quickly address um, the, the, the last question too, is that we, we have energy for the things we care about. You know, if, if we care about things, the energy comes from somewhere to invest, to invest into those things we care about. So, um, you know, to the, to the Q and a person, you know, if, if there's a festival that you really care about, you know, focus your energy there. If there's a festival, you really want to see these things happen at in the UK or wherever, you know, that, that that's, you know, find a place to, to give that nudge and find those people and put that energy in, but it has to come from a place of, of, I really care about this, you know, and so I really want to see something through here. I really want to, you know, a place where you can maybe even take the lead on, on pushing that conversation, right? Um, which I think, you know, also parlays into, into your question, uh, Marianne, is that, um, you know, the, the reason at the core of why I started Country Soul Song, Songbook was because I care. <laughs> You know, I care about country music and Americana music so much, I can't give it up and I have to see it more equitable. I have to see these stages integrated. I have to see them inter intersectional because I want to be there. I care. I got to keep showing up for it. And, I'm, and I, I'm not willing to walk away without seeing the change that I want to see. And so, um, um, you know, I'll just, I just keep harping, harping on, you know, I really, I really believe in the power of the artist to, to make that happen. I believe in the power of, you know, I, you know something that the industry has done over time that this, you know, which kind of harks back to what you were saying, Dom, about, you know, one, one a year, um, is how much it separates us from each other, how, like realizing how separated I felt from my fellow artists of color in country and Americana, um, how we would be like, you know, Reese and I would talk about how we were like ships passing in the night in, in New York, on the New York City alt country scene, you know, and, um, and how sad that was when we could have been supporting each other and lifting each other up that whole time. Um, and so artists, you know, the mythologies that we're fed by these histories and by, um, you know, the ideas of how we make it or how we uh, support ourselves and thrive um, have to be uh, uh, deconstructed as well. That as artists, you know, begin to really create community with each other and show up to these stages and create these spaces that that, you know, 
that immediately makes a, a black, queer, brown, indigenous person on, on the ground who just wants to come to a show makes them feel welcome when they see that they're represented on that stage. And so, um, yeah, that, that, that's just another, you know, artist community, artist community. <laughs> just the mental impact of that too like like i think it, it can't be said enough that mm -hmm. that it, when you come when you show up as an artist and you go to the side stage to go on and and the people before you and after you don't talk to you or or or, or your support act and the headliner doesn't want to meet you or your um you don't get to see you know like we definitely have had that you know, with Della May too, that they never see other women. You know, they are always sandwiched between <laughs> certain acts and, and I love those acts, but it's definitely the case of, you know, we went through, I think almost three years where Della May never ran into I'm with her at, at a festival because they were never on the same day or never at the same festival. And, and that's just one example and, and there's a million of them. But I think that like, um, I think that, this this other part that is like the, what feeds the artist like I would just appreciate you all talking about this because like what feeds an artist is is you see each other on the road and if you never see each other on the road like there's like magic being drained from the operation <laughs> like that's just so huge and artists are also we're taught to be not too demanding you know in order to kind of you know, just just show up. This is your opportunity for this, that, and the other. This is taking your career to to this place or wherever. And we're taught to climb ladders instead of create circles. And so, um, you know, really getting off that that you know, it takes it takes work. It takes risk um, for the artist to make that demand, you know, to to show up to to when someone asks, "Can you be on this bill?" To ask, "Are there any other?" Are there any, uh, you know, am I your token black person on your bill or am I, you know, part of an ecosystem that you're building on this bill? Um, you know, it feels risky, you know, I might lose money. I might, you know, and, and, um, but the more we create community amongst ourselves, the more supported we feel to ask those questions and to, and to make those demands. I think from an audience perspective, there's also, you know, like we go back to placemaking. I, um, I come from more, like I play more old time. I don't, I don't play country. I don't um, play other stuff that tends to happen in different places. But as a black person, knowing that if I'm called to a gig, I wanna go to a workshop, I'm generally driving through a place that is very unsafe for me to be caught in at night. And, you know, may literally be a sundown town is a really big issue. So even from an audience perspective, like one thing about the festival, we're in the city of Fort Worth, for example, and there are, you know, several things like that where it's like Black folks didn't have to be worried about showing up in the center of their own city in a neighborhood they're accustomed to, like, um, you know, a, a lot of the other places in the country where I know I can go, like, I just feel like I have to watch out. It might be a matter of literal safety or, um, you know, someone who is is queer and um, coded very queer by how they're perceived externally. Like there are some places we just, we know we can't, we can't just walk around and take it for granted that we can physically be in that space. And I know that um, visual representations and stuff, they have an impact. Um, we know that there has to be more beyond that, but even, you know, walking into a space and seeing messaging and seeing faces and seeing very explicit things spoken and, um, and represented is going to add to all that. Well, yeah, the, the signage thing that you were saying definitely makes a difference. Um, it was, I had the idea for our theme for this year several years ago um, and our blues festival had gotten like, for lack of a better term, lily white. And then I took it over as like, how do we do this? So we started with the themes, but slowly had the stuff. When we did Carolina Soul, uh, we made sure that we had all the support events were about, you know, Charlie's Place um, in Myrtle Beach or segregated beaches and made sure that the messaging that approached the theme, yeah, you love beach music, great. Let's have this conversation. You can't have one without the other. Our refusal to um, ignore the whole conversation 
And this year, the theme is literally, it still blows my mind that like it's happening. Young, black and blues. <laughs> like, you know, um, and, and white artists are walking up to me in bars and in venues and they're like, hey man, I'd really love to play your festival this year. And I look at them and say, well, the theme this year is young, black and blues. And they, they start going down the list in their head and they're like, oh, oh. And then it goes one of two ways, <laughs> you know? Um, and that's fine. It's a really great natural filter. Um, it's not intended to be exclusionary, um, but it does work that way. Um, and we have to be okay with that. And even the discomfort, like it's uncomfortable for me, <laughs> you know, um, having funders call and ask, uh, we talked for 30 minutes, hang up the phone. And then they say in an email five minutes after we hung up, what's the Blue Society stance on Antifa and Black Lives Matter? We just, we just talked for 30 minutes. That feels pretty cowardly to me. <laughs> you send me an email after we've just been on the phone. And what does it matter? We're an arts institution. We are not a political organization. We're not a social justice organization. Like, you know, so those are the things that we're dealing with. So when we're building audience, um, I think we have to make the messaging for the audience. And there's the part where we draw them in. Um, and then we also have something for them when they arrive, you know? It's like you were invited to dinner. Often we don't know the menu it's at someone's house, but the dinner is enticing enough. We're gonna go, you know. And when we get there, if we don't like it, okay. <laughs> so that's kind of how I feel about it and how we've like set the table in a sense, um, kind of nuance that audience piece. Um, and last year, for the first time, we had for the first time in a long time, um, we had about a 50-50 black white audience. I also think it's important to acknowledge we live in a country that um, is, I think about 60, well, I'm, I'm not a data person, so I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, but we live in a majority white country still. It's changing. So when we look at audiences and where we are regionally, you know, um, I talked to Midwest blue societies, we can't expect them to have a large black audience. It's not happening in rural Wisconsin where there's a blue, it's not happening. <laughs> You know, the large audience is the three black people in town if they happen to like blues, like for some people. And I think that's something else to consider. So how do we um, influence audience that way? And I think it's still having that similar, that synergy and messaging, um, even for those audiences, so that we can educate and, you know, um, inform them without alienate them, without alienating them somehow. Well, I think uh, one of the great things that's starting to develop is that now with the influx of artists, now the artists are like Kamar or, or, and also like Brandy and like yourself, Atiba, are going, coming together and putting together their own package shows so that you can show multiple artists in one space. Because one of the things, again, if you have a once a year rule that's being placed, let that one thing a year expand out into something much broader and I'm, I've been so glad to see so many organizations wanting to expand their program programming out in this type of way you know like I I'm looking back at my notes on uh, Amy's uh, keynote the idea of you know taking up space is one thing that I've really tried to do again when I came into it there was only a selective amount of black roots artists that were available and, and around and present at that time and so for me I kind of took a, an old-fashioned approach I took the Booker T Washington approach of throwing down my bucket and casting it down on the ground where I stand and I always took that approach I think about the first time I was on the Grand Ole Opry and again this is a, a, a learn, was a learning experience as well because I found that in a situation where I assumed one thing would be true I found I was surprised um, and of course, uh, one of the ways I've tried to move forward as an artist outside of my music is to hit them where you can hit them the hardest, which is with knowledge. And now, if you have a, an institution that has certain bylaws, has certain history and a narrative that they've laid out, if you know that whole narrative, know your own narrative, and have figured out a way to make a better narrative out of it, um, I was mentioning in the, in the chat, you know, sometimes you realize that not every stone has been turned. In, in folk music and roots music. And you find this out in very big ways from the source material where people are going. A lot of times people will make a bite-sized quote. This goes back before the internet. And, and if you can go back to those, that source material, find the information that, that relates and be able to bring that forward, you can, really, you can really create some 
new waves, you can create some new movements out of that. So when I went to the Grand Ole Opry, I go there, and I'll, I'll mention this in passing, during the same week, Darius Rucker began performing on, on, the, on the Grand Ole Opry, and then when I was there, Jermaine Jackson actually performed a beautiful version of I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry. So even when I came into that space, there was a notion that there were uh, people of color within country music. It was still very thin and very broadly placed out. But after uh, the group performed, after the Chocolate Drops performed, I was so pleased and honored that Marty Stewart actually called us to his dressing room and said that this was a healing moment for the Grand Ole Opry. Not so much that just because we were performers of color, but we were bringing old-timey music back to the Opry because they, they just hadn't had a lot of old-timey fiddle and banjo groups that were performing. So, uh, and even as, as performers, you know, knowing who Leslie Riddle was, knowing who Linda Martell uh, is, um, you know, those are individual pieces of knowledge that you can present to people in a way that's not confrontational, especially if you know where they're coming from or if you know the perceptions they may have of where you're supposed to be coming from, you can actually turn it around on them and, and allow them to be able to change their perspective and even broaden their opinion of something. And then maybe one last thing I'd like to mention with Michelle, um, uh, she mentioned this, I found that it's so important to learn how to not pull your hand away from people. And that's something that is so important as a representative in your community, is to know how to engage forward. Because some people don't even know that they have reactions that can be very offensive to people because they don't know better. And just to know as a representative, if you are leaning forward into the people you want to connect with instead of approaching them but kind of pulling your hands away from them, that's something that's just a little piece of an approach that you can, you can work. And that works on both levels, you know, whether you're facing a big, a big institution, you know, you want to talk to those people. Every time I came into a venue, I, I came in with the notion I'm supposed to be here instead of saying, are you guys going to allow me to come in? I came in saying, I'm supposed to be here. And it doesn't have to be a confrontation, but that confidence and reassurance can take you much farther. I, and I think about what you just mentioned about coming in saying we need to change things in the blue society. And, you know, at first people were saying, what? Change things? I can't believe it. But because you have brought the notion, it's manifested into something that can evolve into something that it's not always perfect and it takes a while. But you can you can continue taking that first step. You know, you got to walk before you can run, you know, and I, I've always uh, thought about that as, as I was as I've gone along. It's just, if you bring the knowledge with you, you're an individual tradition bearer for the knowledge that you're sharing with others. And, and as I mentioned before, I always keep extra songs around, not just songs that I would perform, but songs that I could see other people performing. So when I meet them, um, you know, like Brandy had mentioned, she was born and raised in Georgia, so I grabbed a lot of the field recordings I thought might be interesting for her, or songs or things that she mentioned, and always keeping an open mind knowing that your knowledge doesn't have to be just for you as an artist. It can be for others. And that, that again, helps out uh, creating community in a way that's very individualistic. And I guess the last thing I'll mention is um, the first question here. If, um, if you find you're in a jam where there is unsavory material, you don't have to take that. Um, go to the leader of the jam at some point and tell them that you were offended you don't have to confront that person head on because that's a that's a situation that you don't necessarily have to walk into but you don't have to take that i had a friend of mine tell me that he was asked to play a, a song with racist lyrics and he was uncomfortable he told the fellow that he was uncomfortable but the guy had handouts and um you yeah, know he said he walked off i said that's the best thing you can do in a situation like that and if you bring it up to your people who have, who are leading the jam Hopefully, the, you know, he said his friend that led the jam told him that guy was not going to be there again. And so you can, you can, you know, use your voice and be active as a, you know, as a citizen and really, and really make some change in ways you just never expected. And I've been in that same boat when I got into old time. There's not a big scene here in Fort Worth, the Dallas area. So it's the only black person, almost always the only woman in that age difference that Dom talks about. And sometimes it would happen. I'm like, I can't sing that. We can't do that in the set or whatever. Um, something Dom said that ties to Brad's question about um, conversations with improving diversity 
efforts. Um, I wanted to add to the knowledge you bring um, the data part of it. There's an IG account called Book More Women and they take festival posters and they take out all the names that are not women or femmes and they put the data below. And um, this is more kind of like my philosophy of it, right? So if you have your token or you say you're being diverse or whatever, um, sometimes people need data, especially when you're dealing with organizations that are having to do reporting on grants and having to put together annual reports to see, we think we're being diverse, but if we're 80% white, and I'll say dominant whiteness because white doesn't even mean one thing. And then 20% everybody else, all of us homogenize into one little diversity lump, then that is going to be something that um, you either can't ignore or if you ignore it, we've learned something about your organization. I have a thought to share on the audience, diversifying the audience. Cause I, it's like, we hear people talk about it for a long time and, and honestly, we also, I love that like y'all are talking about what people's, what the um, knowledge is that each person brings to bear in their work. And what is the knowledge we ask people to bring to bear in different roles. And a lot of times we focus so much on the presenter's role of programming as the solution, right? The programming by pro, and, and, I, and I wanna book more women, I wanna book more of all of everyone. Um, but I actually also think we need to we need to redefine the presenter's role in community building in their own community. That, that, that when you see, you know, when you hear Atiba talk about why some things are working, it's because you're out in the community <laughs> knowing people and, and they know you, and then they like want to come to that thing. And I think a lot of our music, a lot of our folk and bluegrass and other related organizations that present music started a group of friends presenting music for the, because they wanted their friends to get together and to be able to see the music they loved. And I think to tap back into that, like make new friends, back to Amy's point number one, like make new friends so that new people will come to your venue means you have to go and like, instead of going to the thing you always go to on the first Friday of the month, you have to go to the thing you've never been to and you're the only person like that there. Um, and then go to another thing where you're the only person like that there until like you kind of get to know a few people and it sounds so basic it's like the first day of college or high school or like whatever but it's like um you know what table are you choosing to sit at at the lunchroom like <laughs> you know and and i think um I, I actually think managers have to help i don't think we have to put it all on artists like it's not all on artists to diversify our rooms it's it's on us to kind of redefine our job descriptions so that we're not just thinking in terms of publicity and radio, but we're talking about publicity, radio, and community relationships. <laughs> um, but that's just like, I'm still, I'm turning on this. This is the thing. This is like one of the big things I'm really turning on is, is, is just, you know, why is it always on the artists to do the work? It, it has to be on all of us together. Yeah, I mean, strong messaging is key in all of this. Artists, bookers, promoters, institutions on what are they trying to do? Because if, if the audience doesn't know what you're trying to do, I mean, I can say personally, since I've, I made a conscious effort to present traditional music in my set every show, uh, people know where I'm standing on certain things. And the audience can be empowered if they know where you're coming from. And that alone... Uh, can can lead to a, a proliferation of the audience. I mean, I've seen over the past 20 years, again, I'm, you know, there were just a few artists that I knew and I kind of kept a, I kept a log book of everybody just because there were so few people and it was just growing a little bit every year. But now to see that it's gone beyond the people I have in my immediate, um, in, in my immediate periphery. Um, like I believe I, I met Brandy, I had met one of her, uh, one of her, uh, uh, old time uh, uh, partners uh, years back and I happened to find a CD and I was looking up their band and I happened to see Brandy on one of the videos featuring the band, the Lone Star String Band. And I, w I wondered, who is this person Brandy? And so all I did was I just emailed her out of the blue and said, hey Brandy, I like what you're doing. Um, let me know if I can be of assistance in any way. And, and because I keep a library of music, my 
big pitch is always telling people, hey, if you need source material, and also with string band stuff, I know a lot of people, um, especially people of color, want to want to hear string band music by, played by people of color. So I always keep a repository around so that it can be heard. So that, again, to break the idea that you're the only one doing it. And again, the big, the big antagonist in a lot of these conversations is not being heard. It's not like a physical enemy, but it's the enemy of not being heard or not being seen in your world of music. And, and I think that that can always be something that can, that, that can uh, continue to grow as we advocate for diversity. And, um, I, I, and, and of course, strong talking points help. But for artists, I'm always telling people, like, if we think of folk music on at least a collegiate level in some type of way, because folk music's either a specialized practitioner a lot of times or it's kids' music. But the world in between, the young people that are between the, the you know, I guess post-college age, let's say, you know, 21 to 35, there's a big gap, especially when it comes to um, uh, topics and material that might be a bit more intense for the kiddos, but it's something that at, at a young adult age, you want to tackle this stuff head on to show that there are precedents uh, to, um, to all of this music. That's something that can be so powerful. And as an artist, being able to condense these bigger notions down into something concise so an audience can walk away and say, oh yeah, I, I, I see where you're coming from, and then they can apply that to their life. That's something that um, I think that there's a power in, in being able to do that and really being concise with it because some stories are longer than others, but really being able to put it right into a fine point so that your audience is always knowing where you're coming from. Instead of sometimes, you know, people being of different backgrounds and whatnot, they may not know where you're coming from on some of the things. Or they might say, why is this relevant compared to what we've already heard? And those are things that the artist ha having small talking points can do. And I learned that Again, um, there were, as, as an artist of color, I've also been influenced by white artists. When I met Mike Seeger, his notion of taking styles was a big influence on me, because then, as an African-American and Mexican-American person, I can bring my own version of what styles mean into my own performance. And so that's a way to be able to be influenced by someone that's not of the same background, but I can apply the things that work with what they were able to do. Dave Van Ronk's another example beautiful storyteller and being able to take that notion of storytelling and put it into my own sort of form it allows me to diversify where I'm grabbing my material as and also you know it allows me to emphasize and you know diversify the things I'm talking about um, I'm going to interrupt a little bit here because we're coming towards the end um, and so if, if anyone has questions I promised you we would we'd answer questions in the Q&A box but I also want to say um, we haven't heard from Charlie or Joe in a while. I'm just wondering if either of you have anything to add to this right now, you know, in any of the topics that we've been discussing. Well, I was just, I'm not really sure what it ties back into, but uh, for some reason it spawned, jogged my, my mind as being founder of a music, a music venue, a social club. I'm part owner and founder of a social club in my community that welcomes artists that I really, you know, crossed paths with through Dark Water Rising. So um, many races and backgrounds have performed there in Robinson County. Um, so it takes a, a little bit of groundwork in that sense of like uh, Brandy was talking about space making. And so we've created our own space. We've created our own venue to, you know, bring about the changes that we want to see. And I was also founder of a nonprofit years ago called Peace in the Park, because whenever my band started out, there really were no venues in Robinson County for us to perform in outside of church. And so we learned a lot through our travels with Dark Water Rising and then brought it back to our community to build the, the local music scene there. Um, so I've been very fortunate to, to meet folks of all back, you know, many backgrounds along my travels and then to, to bring them in a predominantly Native American community to where we're not really exposed to a lot of different genres other than what we hear on the radios or within our churches on Sundays. So, um, Again, just happy to be included in this conversation.
and to continue <clears throat> to continue collaborating with you and and just networking is key. And uh, it's very basic. It seems very basic for us to have this conversation, but I think yeah, at the end of the day, we just need to get back to just being humans, um, fighting for good instead of letting these systems, you know, try to take us down. Just continue to be resilient in these ways. That's I also Charlie. just want to give a quick shout out to Charlie is, you know, coming to the Durham community over the next year. I, I don't know how long you're going to do it. I hope forever, but she's bringing uh, her Tuesday tune up to Durham. And I'm really excited for the, for that bridge that you're building between Robinson yeah. County and Durham, you know, that's going to be so key to create, creating opportunities um, for, for the artists and that you'll be bringing our way, you know, I can't right. wait to help and, and support them, you know. I'll just say on the theme of groundwork and the basics that um, anybody who's out there trying to do this work, remember that if you're not doing work on yourself, then you risk doing as much harm as good. So self-work can look a lot of different ways, but it starts with understanding that everybody is physically and emotionally affected by systemic oppression. And so if you're not working and understanding how you're affected personally, then you're not going to be effective in the work you try to do in the community. Please start with you and then go outward. All right, so do we have any other questions from, from the audience? I just give everyone a chance to say a final word and then um, then I'll go ahead and play the end credits. So if anyone has any last minute things to say, uh, you can go ahead and say it now. I just want to say thank you again to everybody. And it's so good to see everyone. And, and we all have these wonderful relationships together through our, our business and our artistry. And it's wonderful that we can all get together and share our thoughts in this way. I just think it's absolutely amazing. I thank you for all your wonderful words. I want to just give a shout out to like IBMA and Folk Alliance International, Pine Cone, Bluegrass Situation, Brad Kalotner asked his question with the Baltimore Old Time Music Festival. Like these are places that to greater or lesser degree are engaging and are being intentional about it and are taking a posture, at least in my interaction, are taking a posture of listening and not trying to tell the people they want to include how they need to be included. Yeah, just a word of thanks that these conversations just leave me so inspired and full of energy for the next for the next phase of development as an artist and as an activist. So I just appreciate y'all. I'm really, I'm really moved by also the folks, the part there, there are many participants here who are panelists and like, it's like, it's humbling, 500% uh, uh, humbling. And I think um, it's just, it's, it's, thank you for this conversation. It's incredible. And donate to these nonprofits y'all. Look at all the. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say thanks to everybody. Uh, it's been really great to you know meet some new faces and then see some old ones like I haven't seen Kamara. I've mixed her. <laughs> I haven't got to see her uh, since before the pandemic. Um, but thanks to everybody for all these great ideas. Um, you know, we all come from different perspectives and different experience levels. I very much feel like a newbie in the nonprofit sphere. I very much feel like a newbie in the um, in the blues world. You know. <laughs> And as an arts administrator, so it's always nice to have new connections. And I'll probably be reaching out to all of you to um, share ideas and pick your brains. And then I'll do shameless self promotion May 21st, Carolina Blues Festival, PiedmontBlues.org. <laughs> so I'm going to play the credits now. Just want to mention a couple of things. We will be posting a recording of this on our YouTube channel. So um, if you want to watch it again, you can, or you can tell your friends about it. Uh, it might be a week or two because we have to get a couple of things cleaned up out of it, all the places where I fumbled with the uh, controls and things like that. <laughs> um, and uh, just want to say thank you to everyone here. Um, and on the note of donating, I uh, want to mention that this was, we're offering this free of charge, but if you're able to donate to help us to offset the cost of this, we are really happy that for you to do that. We have information about that in the end of our, um, in, our in the end of our credits. So 
please stick around and please consider donating. And if you can go visit, it's a beautiful drive to get there in North Carolina. It's an amazing place.